Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi there, it's Dr. Gemma, and welcome to episode 127 of the new series of Cognitive. My goodness, it's been an interesting week. Uh, Spring has landed. That would be the major thing. And with it came, of course, the desire for new and fresh things. And, well, you know, the start I just got just a little bit out of control. Meanwhile... Your comments are very welcome. You can comment either on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or you can go over to our Ravelry group. It's been a very interesting week in those terms, so let me tell you warm thanks first. Well, first of all, many warm thanks to Sustainable Living, who says, and I just quoted her whole cloth here, Moringa is an incredible plant and has been kind of discovered in the West for a while now. People in Indonesia and the Philippines have used the leaves in cooking for a very long time, and the seeds can be used to purify water and for all kinds of things. Here, I assume she means in the U.S., many people use the powdered form, even Costco sells it now, in green drinks and such. The plant is fairly fast growing, but needs a more tropical environment. She says later you can't really grow it here, I believe. I, again, I think in the most of the U.S. Since you said that you are getting snow in your area, it probably won't make it. I have planted several plants, but none have made it so far. One my chickens got when it was still little and completely destroyed it, and the others fell victim to gophers. And she tells us that a podcast, and there's a link Sustainable World Radio tells you all about Moringa. She's got like four episodes on there. Meanwhile, we all rejoice because Tiny Shiny Things is back. And she was sort of laughing at me talking about the language of fiber being heavily involved in even modern English. So she says, and I quote, Hey, Dr. Gemma, are you spinning me a yarn? Here in Scotland, that means you are embroidering the truth. Another favorite of mine is to be on tenterhooks. By the way, I love all of these. I know these and I enjoy them. I am not sure if they're particularly Scottish, but I certainly know them and that makes me happy. Another favorite of mine is to be on tenterhooks, usually mispronounced as tender hooks. Tenter hooks were bent pins in a wooden frame used in the production of cloth as far back as the 14th century. I did not know that. Anyway, tenterhooks means nervous anticipation, which is quite understandable when your fabric might rip or come loose at any moment. You, of course, can follow the thread of a story or make yourself some pin money. Jane Austen talks about that quite a bit. That is a small amount of money for spending on essentials such as pins if you're a woman. That was fun seeing how many I could remember. By the way, I also use you as a sleep buddy. Oh, the count's just going up. Actually, TST goes on to say... And I believe Sustainable Living says, don't be offended by that. It really helps me sleep, but I listen to you when I'm awake. I just find your voice soothing. I cannot believe anybody finds my voice soothing, but thank you. I appreciate that. Meanwhile, you all will be wondering what's on my hooks and needles. Well, it's been an exciting week. And if you hear creaking in the background, Minerva is messing with the door of my study. She can't decide if she wants in or out. Okay, so you all are probably wondering what's on my hooks and needles. Well, it's been a pretty cool week around here. We have a lot of finished and a lot of starditis. In the finished category, yes, I finished Vestuary 2023 at long last. I love it. I love it. I am experiencing some mixed feelings because part of me wants to smack myself silly that I waited like 13 years to use this yarn 
in a sweater. And then the other part of me is really relieved that I waited 13 years because now I know how to make a vest. <laughs> so I got something I really like out of it. It's very handsome. I have been wearing it almost nonstop since I finished the ribbing on the second sleeve. It just came out great. I also finished the first in my recent spate of Franken socks. This is called officially I Need Me Some Stripes Sock. And I really did, and I still do. I enjoyed this sock way more than I should have, and I am currently on the foot about four inches in of the second one. Since I'm a top-down knitter, that's pretty happy. I had so much fun with this one. I just went crazy on the stripes. It is absolutely madcap looking. So then I went back to the second Spring is Coming sock and I finished that too. In that picture, my legs are not swollen. What I did was I was wearing socks and leggings. And when I finished the second Spring is Coming, I just pulled them right on over the socks and leggings I had on. So that's why my legs look much wider than they actually are. I love them. Again, they went right onto my feet the next morning. And that made me happy, but other things made me happy, such as the in-progress list, because Stash Toss 2023, I'm now at four skeins in and 33 out. I got a freebie. Queenie came into the study, grabbed a ball of yarn that I really wanted to get rid of, and did it for me. This was an old bulky, oh, I can't even think what it was. I know I used it in stuff that I gave away that I didn't really like. Anyway, it's gone. But also I got to take out the skein for the Spring is Coming socks and four skeins for Vestuary 2023. So that was incredibly satisfying. So right now we are at four skeins in versus 33 out since January 1st. Meanwhile, you can see a lovely picture of the second I Need Me Some Striped socks. As you can tell, I'm on the foot there. Actually, I'm much further along now since I took that picture. As I said, I'm four inches into my five and three quarter inch foot. So that should be finished pretty soon, which is nice because when I pulled out the yarn from my old stash for the Spring is Coming socks, I pulled out two skeins that I looked at and said, I can't believe I still have these and I've never used them. The second one is there. I started a second pair of socks as I always intended to. I knew this was going to be a pair of socks made because I wanted to get this stuff out of my stash. So the second one is in a yarn TARDIS blue from C. Jane Knit. And you can find all of this in my show notes. I have a link to my Ravelry page to get all the information. But there it is in TARDIS blue. And I'm actually doing a blueberry waffle sock with it. So these are the Blueberry Who socks. On that one you can see I have just finished the two inches of ribbing at the top and I have one repeat of the Blueberry Waffle there. I'm a bit further than that now. I've got about four inches or five inches total. This one is really fun to do. I love Blueberry Waffle socks and when I have a solid or a semi-solid that is my pattern of choice for them using my typical measurements and my own vanilla sock pattern. And I like blueberry waffles. I like what they do to a solid or mostly solid yarn. And also they're fun. They're like knitting stripes that it's a four row repeat. And it's just as simple as this. Two rows of plain stockinette and then two rows of knit two purl two. And you just keep going. And I love the way it comes out. I love the grid pattern. And it keeps me entertained the same way stripes do. And then... I said, but but I finished the Spring is Coming socks and I've I've got a free needle and, and I've got all this extra yarn from the Spring is Coming. So you can see I started another pair of Franken socks and those are called the Spring Frankies. And you can see if you look carefully that the ribbing on it is indeed from the same yarn as the Spring is Coming socks. There it was, this big hunk of yarn in my hand. And I mean big, that was a generous put up in that last yarn for those socks. And so, you know, I just went ahead and started with two inches of ribbing one by one for the top. And I'm a few stripes in there, as you can see. I'm having a grand old time. My biggest fear, that first purple is a hand spun. It's a little thick, but it worked out great. But I'm not sure if I have enough. 
And then that white. I'm not sure if I have enough of that. We will see. I have so many scraps. I'm sure I can cobble together something. Meanwhile, next to the cardboard carton of Doomy Doom Doom, where I have odds and ends left over from the Don't Know Yet blanket and various other projects, which I shouldn't have. I should have emptied it with the Don't Know Yet blanket, which is still in progress, by the way, but I'll come back to that. But anyway, next to that on the floor, I have the basket of confusion where I've been throwing extra bits and bobs and pieces of equipment. And in there, there's a few leftover skeins, just oddballs. So I went into that and I found a beautiful colorway that I bought from Dizzy Blonde Studios not too long ago, maybe like a year or two ago. Anyway, it's a sock weight. It's a lightweight sock. And it's a very generous put up. I think it's like 580 yards. And I looked at it and said, I don't want to make socks out of that. It's just beautiful. The colorway is slippery slope. At any rate, I said, what the heck? And I miss crocheting because I'm not crocheting every day the way I was for a while there to make the blocks for the don't know yet. So I started yet another country cotton shawl. It's making me so happy. Look at that picture. If you get a chance to drop by, look at the show notes. It is the most insanely beautiful colorway. And I really, really want a shawl in those colors. It's a very woodsy brown and green. The green going into almost forest green, but a little hint of blue in it, not quite teal. And then silver. And then a really nice medium brown with just a hint of sunlight in it. It looks like you're squinting through the trees on a sunny day to me. So that is becoming a country cotton shawl. And that thing, as always, goes at the speed of light. I think it's supposed to be 47 rows. I think I'm up to row 18. Of course, it gets wider as it goes. But it's a very, very fast crochet. And I really recommend that pattern. Even though Lion Brand Yarns made the pattern for its country cotton yarn, which I believe is extinct, the pattern is still there, and it's an absolute winner for a crochet shawl in a lace or any sock weight. Actually, you could use this in any weight, and it would look great. But I think it really shines because of the laciness in the lighter weight yarns. And if you've got a lot of extra, this would make a great scrap shawl. Just saying. Meanwhile, the lane splitter, well, it's here at my feet. And I want to work on it. <laughs> but I haven't touched it. Also at my feet is the Lady Eleanor shawl. And that's another one that I'm really very far into that. I'm more than halfway through it and I want to get back to. I keep debating if I'm going to put the sort of beady fringe on the edge of it because I don't like it. I really just like it with the blunt end or maybe tassels, but at any rate, it doesn't matter because I'm not there yet. The don't know yet is sitting forlornly on my love seat in here. It needs me to go back to it. And I'm so close to finished, and I always kind of bog at a moment like this. But I have plans on a cool morning to come out here next time I wake up early like I did today. To just come in here and sit with it. This morning I had too much work in my deaf culture class to sit down with it. And it's kind of bugging me because I really could finish this without that much struggle. We're just attaching those last three completed rows and weaving in ends. Well, I'll get there. And of course, the Pennsylvania Dutch Embroidery, not yet, but stay tuned. I finally got a link for Raspberry Studios onto my list of my favorite resources. So let me just tell you, for hand-dyed yarns, Lisa Susie Yarns and Dizzy Blonde Studio. For just general supplies, I would say Webs, Alpaca Direct, and Woolen Company. For LYSs, Sierra Cotton and Wools, if you're in Bishop, California, the Altered Stitch in Valley Village down here in L.A., and the Knitting Tree down by LAX in L.A., and Letelier on Ventura Boulevard. Meanwhile, what did I miss? Oh, yes, Birch and Cider, if you like those cool little screw-in leather tags that everybody puts on their hats these days. And, of course, Raspberry Studios on Etsy for your Chatelaine supplies. You will also see right under that, Blankets Paw Print. I got a very sweet little card from our vet, and they took a final paw print of my blanks. And it made me so happy. It really made me happy. And of course, it makes me 
a little bit sweetly sad, but it's there because Blankets deserves her last mark in the podcast. Dizzy Blondes. Well, still doing a fuzzball of Minerva Daily. I want to search out the silk. I found the silk that I'd already spun that I want to blend it with, and I don't know what I did with it. But that will lead into other things that went on this week, so I will come back to that too. But basically, I started searching the study for it. It may be down in the bottom of the cardboard garden of Doomy Doom Doom. Meanwhile, a strategy. Well, we finally landed there. Shikata Ga Nai, which is a Buddhist-Japanese concept of acceptance and letting go. What this literally means in Japanese, apparently, is it cannot be helped, or it is what it is. That is that really nothing can be done about it. And that means this is really about accepting simply what is. So this is the concept of just accepting the things we cannot change so that we can move on. This is pretty much straight up acceptance from the ACT hexagon, that is the ACT model of therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, which of course is not meant to be a cognitive behavioral therapy, but as far as I'm concerned, it pretty much is. That to me, the ACT hexagon is pure cog B. Now the guy who invented it says it's not, and you can use it with any type of therapy. And I see his point because the hexagon is about the six things that people come in therapy to get versus their opposite. And the opposite of acceptance is the avoidance of the experiences we need for growth. So lack of acceptance is refusal to change, refusal to move, staying stuck where you are. So Shikata Ganai is the necessity in life of simply not being able to do that. By the way, this reminds me to say, if you follow The Daily Show, Jordan Klepper has been hosting this week as one of the guest hosts, and he had on the hot young philosopher who's talking about stoicism in modern times. And it was a really great clip, and I think it's worth watching. And yeah, I was amused because the responses to it on Instagram were kind of embarrassing that people were just condemning Stoicism without actually reading anything and saying, well, it's from the Romans and they're all bad, or it's from a Roman emperor and he's bad. You really should do some history, guys. If you're after Marcus Aurelius for being a bad guy, you obviously haven't met some of his predecessors or his son. Nonetheless, it's very odd because this speaker just went back to the basic four principles of Stoicism which are wisdom, justice, courage, and discipline. What amused me was that somebody said, and then cognitive behavioral therapy co-opted Stoicism. Um, no, actually, <laughs> the implication is somehow the Cogby people stole Stoicism. No, I think we can honestly say we know we're using it. And I wouldn't call it co-opting. I would say mm, it works really well and we've got the research to prove it. One of the interesting things was people kept saying, but there's no compassion in that. And for that, I would refer you to Marcus Aurelius, the meditations, because he actually talks about that quite a lot. He talks about that when you are using the four values, wisdom, justice, courage, and discipline, discipline, um, probably not the way we think of it in the 21st century. He means the use of moderation in all things. And he would probably roll that into wisdom and justice. That, In other words, Marcus Aurelius at least says, if you're being wise, you understand compassion. And he talks constantly about kindness and mercy to others. So again, you know, as people get all caught up in this, we, you know, before you go jumping into that deep end of the philosophy pool, you probably want to read something instead of just watching a sound bite on the Daily Show and then saying you are an expert and condemning it all or reading some later critic who, you know, that's great if they don't agree with Stoicism, but you don't really know why because you've never read Stoicism. So I would say, you know, go read it. But it was very nice to to see that Jordan Klepper did that, that he had that guy on. And it was an interesting piece. I personally am a Stoic. I always have been. Well, I have been since I was 14 and I read the meditations in Latin. 
and they they translate reasonably well into English. But again, you get in trouble with words like discipline because um, you do realize it's from the word to study or to learn from. It's not meaning punishment. And so a lot of modern people don't quite seem to know that. It's an interesting model, and it certainly influences Christianity. For those of you who are medieval fans, when you hear those four values, you may be harking back to the four daughters of God. I'm just saying that's pretty old medieval stuff. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But again, you can see Christianity reacting to Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius or at least Epictetus, in The Four Daughters of God, that even Christianity is troubled by the idea that you can't simply boot out justice. And they add in mercy, which is a lovely thing, and they switch out, I think, truth for uh, wisdom would be my guess. It's been a few years since I've looked at this. At any rate, it's a very influential set of thoughts. And so you know, go back and go through Instagram and look up The Daily Show and you can find the clip. But I wanted to put that in because I was amused to find out that as a cod beef therapist, I have somehow stolen or co-opted or somehow unreasonably borrowed <laughs> stoicism. No, kids, I've been living it since oh, 1974. But at any rate, um, I don't want to argue with the guy who invented the act hexagon. He's clearly a better researcher and a more experienced clinician than I am. But all I am saying is every time I look at that hexagon, and it is in the show notes, if you want to go have a look at it, I'm always stunned by the idea that people who are not doing God B consider this to be in their therapy. And that might be my, <laughs> my blinkered way of looking at the world. The problem with doing God B is once you do it, and once you're using it as a clinician, it's pretty universal and it makes a lot of sense to you. However, that comment about Stoicism not including compassion, I have to say it's not an empty comment, it's, although I'm gently poking fun at it, because that is what drove Marsha Linehan to adapt Cog B into DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, that she felt that compassion needed to be raised to a higher level of attention in cognitive behavioral therapy. So it is no surprise that someone as brilliant as Professor Linehan is saying that about Cog B, and then you've got somebody listening to uh, a modern philosopher talking about Stoicism, and they're saying, well, where's the compassion? It's in there, but you've got to have a kind of Roman mentality to know where it's showing up. That was a long digression to tell you shikata ga nai, acceptance and letting go. Again, we have this ongoing theme in the Buddhist Japanese teachings that the world is made of change and that we must move gracefully with the change. I do want to be careful to point out, none of this says that you should be passive or helpless. And Stoicism doesn't either, by the way. I'm a little mystified by some of the people who seem to think it does. You're not supposed to just blindly accept everything. You do have to keep in mind, in all fairness to the critics, that this is something developed in a world where slavery exists and where people are in a highly stratified system of hierarchy and rank. So yeah, they are going to be talking to people who have no hope of ever changing where they are economically and in terms of their freedom. And so Stoicism is meant to address that, is meant to help you to keep going, even if you're in a very difficult position in life. However, to say that's no longer relevant would be the same as saying nobody in our modern world is trapped in a situation that they will never escape. And we don't owe them anything in terms of a philosophy of how to survive that. So do with that as you will. Meanwhile, in the fluffy books, I finally finished A Malevolent Connection by Lynn Messina. This is number nine in the Beatrice Hyde Clare series, and it interlocks with number one in her Verity Lark series, A Lark's Tale. And it's a very, very clever interweaving of the plot, so much so that I'm looking forward to reading book 10 in Beatrice Hyde Clare and book two in Verity Lark. Uh, in my television life, 
I actually sat through all four seasons of The Worst Witch on Netflix, and here's why. It was published before the Harry Potter series were. And when you watch it, you cannot help but notice how much J.K. Rowling owes to this book, at least to the first book or two in the series. Now, the author of The Worst Witch, and I cannot remember her name, Jill, and I can't remember her last name, she keeps publishing books, and she has continuously published books in the series right up to 2018. And so her books, each one is a term at the witch school, cackles, and now you can sort of see where there's going to be a bit of a problem that they're kind of interleaved between the publications of the Potter books and I believe afterwards, which creates an interesting situation. When you watch the TV series, first thing you're going to think is, boy, Rowling has to have read the opening book in the series. There's so much in common there and I'm not going to rehearse it. However, Rowling goes in this other direction of the apocalyptic narrative. Both series are firmly set in the British tradition of the, what do they call it, like the public school book of kids go away to a residential school where they're in this world where the parents are not present and authority is represented by the teachers and the teachers aren't quite plugged into the wall and they're wearing uniforms and they're, they've got their own codes and everybody's into the sports, yada, yada, yada. Okay. And so I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the line, someone accused Rowling of plagiarizing at least the opening book of The Worst Witch. I wouldn't at all be surprised. I haven't read it, so I don't know, but I have to tell you the similarities are a little unsettling. As you progress through the series, there, there is a bad guy who is pretty consistent through the series, although that person is literally lurking in the background for many parts of it. Additionally, I believe the writers for the television scripts are not going through the book sequentially. Uh, based on having read summaries, it looks like they're kind of hopping around and picking out stories that they think will work. So I don't know this. I haven't read this series, but it's an interesting thing. The actress in the first three years is replaced in the fourth year. She goes on to be on Game of Thrones and I believe is one of the leads in The Rest of Us right now. And she gets Bella Ramsey and she gets replaced by another actress and I actually start to prefer the second actress, but Bella Ramsey kind of grows up with the series. You can see her learning as she goes. The second actress in the fourth year couldn't stand her in the beginning because she has a habit of just looking slack-jawed when she's not speaking her lines and she starts getting over that. So it's kind of fun watching people grow up on set, I guess is what I'm really saying. But I did enjoy the series. It's very juvenile. It really is. It's kind of a girl power thing in many ways, but it does play out the best and worst of that whole British public school genre sort of thing. And I still enjoyed it. The things that go wrong for our heroine, for poor Mildred Hubble, are kind of fun. And also the lead witch of the school, Miss Cackle, is a very interesting counterpoint to Albus Dumbledore. And I must say, I prefer Miss Cackle, but there we go. Okay, that's The Worst Witch on Netflix. So there I was, excited about magic, and I went back and said, oh, look, A Good Witch, which used to be a Hallmark series for an astonishing, like, nine years. And I thought, surely I was interested in this. It showed up on my to-be-continued list on Netflix. Then I started watching it, and I found out why I turned it off. Seriously? wear sunglasses, the blinding whiteness. It's a soap opera, first of all. Secondly, the characters are so bland, none of them interested me at all. But thirdly, there's one character, there's a new doctor in town and all the women are hot for him and, and they just make every sexist joke in the book on this. And anyway, the new doctor has the rebellious teenage son who wants to go back to New York. Frankly, after sitting through three or four episodes of this, I want to go back to New York with him. It is, it is just unbelievable. It is the worst of the worst. It is everything that reminds you 
why you don't watch this kind of show. It is paper white. Now look, guys, I'm pretty white myself, and even I couldn't stand it. I mean, you can't believe it. it's like, oh, look, an adorable little town. I think it's supposed to be in Vermont or something where the weather's never that bad. We see snow, but it never seems to stick. And everybody can walk to everything. It's got an adorable town center and a cute little mayor who's just as obnoxious as she can be. I mean, it, it is every appalling cliche from Hallmark. Did I mention it's blindingly white? Like, after a while, you're just going, please, anybody, anybody. There must be, can we have anybody? Can we have a Native American, a half Native American? Is there an Asian in the cast? Like, it's so unreal. It's just weird that, like, and you think, wow, most of my life, I watch shows like this. Not quite this bad in terms of plot. I mean, boring would be a generous description. But it's, it's like snow blindness. Like, come on, guys. You're embarrassing yourselves. Oh, my God. And I don't know. I've never watched the Hallmark Channel. And I have to say, based on this, I probably never will. I'm willing to pay Netflix to take it out of my feet. It's so appalling. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't even know why I'm reviewing it, except I can't stop laughing. I mean, bad would be a compliment. Okay, something I really like. This is my adorable little cat with a butcher knife in its mouth. Magnetic Needle Keeper for Embroidery. This is from Adventure Needlework, and the picture is right there, and it says it all. I really like this. This really exceeded expectations because the magnet on the back is really strong. What you're supposed to do is put this on your embroidery in the hoop. Just put it right there on a part of the hoop you're not working on, you know, right inside the hoop on the fabric with the magnet on the, on the back side. So you get this adorable little thing and your needles will stick to it. So when you're not using a needle, you can just stick it right onto this thing and your needle doesn't go rolling away. It also makes an adorable lapel pin and I was really impressed with this because the magnet was so strong. I put it on the lapel of a very thick blazer, a wool tweed, and it stayed on. You got to admit, if there's anybody you know who wants to wear a cat with a butcher knife on their lapel, they, you got to direct them to this. This is Adventure Needlework on Etsy, and I just love it. And she's got a whole bunch of these. There are many sites who have similar things all over Etsy. This one was very reasonably priced. I think it was about $9.50. And I, as you can tell, I quite like it. Let's move on to put a lid on it. Well, the tea tastings continue. You may remember that I drank the magical butterfly herbal tea from Plum Deluxe Hot a while back, and I liked it. And it turns blue, and you've got to love that. But everybody kept writing to me and saying, really, magical butterfly is a great iced tea. Turns out everybody was right. So I have given you a picture of the ingredients so you could see it. It's really just a specialty. It's a lot of fun. Now, I found that it maxes out when you mix it one-to-one -one with the Trader Joe's house brand of sparkling water in black cherry. Wow! Because the black cherry flavor does not drown out anything else. It's subtle enough, but it's just a little perk in the background, and it just sets off all these wonderful flavors like rose hips and apple and hibiscus. It just, and the blackberry leaves, it just sets it all off so perfectly. So there we go. There is a picture of the label, and this is a Plum Deluxe, and I really recommend this for iced tea. I'm just putting it in diffusers in a quart jar, and letting it sit in the sun and then eventually refrigerating it. But I let it sit out for, you know, hours all afternoon until it gets nice and dark and then I fridge it. You can also see that I got bored. What day was this? I think this was Saturday. We had the first week of real spring here where it hit 70 and it was gorgeous all week long. And it would pop down to like 55 and it would pop up to 70 it would be wonderful. So all my patients were absconding. They were all just disappearing with, you know, oh, got to go see my grandmother in Poughkeepsie type of 
excuses and I didn't blame them. So Saturday I had so few patients. I actually made brownies <laughs> in an unexpected break. And then of course, Saturday night, the boys and I went out as we always do to celebrate the beginning of my weekend. We go out to the local Mexican place. And when the warm weather is upon us, we then go down to the local market and we buy pints of Rebel ice cream. And there you can see the chocolate ice cream. And it is in a picture of upside down brownie a la mode. That is, there's a pint of the Rebel chocolate just sitting there with a brownie on top of it. I have to tell you, this was exquisite. This was exquisite. So there you go. Brownie a la mode, Gemma style, which is to say ice cream a la mode with brownie on top. Also, because I had so few patients, believe it or not, Wednesday afternoon, everybody just vanished. So there I am at 1 p.m., my normal lunchtime, looking at my schedule going, anybody? Anybody? Hello? And since nothing but crickets answered, I went out and I had me a day. Because this was Wednesday afternoon, and I don't see patients again till noon on Thursdays. So I essentially had 23 hours to myself. And there you can see the first thing I did. I went for a poke bowl down at my favorite sushi place in Santa Clarita. That would be Kisho Sushi. And there you can see it. It's so generous. It's so wonderful. And yeah, it's pretty keyed up. So that would lead to the blather and some of the things that went on there. So this was, in my blather, I called an afternoon of crafty therapy. One of my patients showed me that she is doing a temperature blanket, except instead of temperatures, she's got this whole chart of books she's reading, the genre, the length, hero or heroine, the race of the writer. I mean, she's really going for this. And she's making different crochet squares to represent each mix of these categories. She's basing this on a basic sunflower or sunburst crochet square. And I'm giving you the link that she recommended. I think it's called Susie Maker is the website. And the, her patterns are not on Ravelry, but this is a classic crochet square pattern and I recommend it. So there is the link. So she showed me that and then I had the afternoon off. So then I started looking around on Ravelry at Granny Square cardigans and I'm really considering it because I have a bunch of Granny Squares sitting at my feet. Meanwhile, I went off and I had my pokey and then I went over to Joanne Fabrics and I started looking at the equipment for cutting chain for jewelry because I need to sort of clean up, well, I needed to clean up my chatelaines. Then some of them had equipment that already had a chain on it and hooked onto the chain that was already on the base chatelaine. So I had to separate some chains and mess around there. And I did, and that was really fun. So I cleaned up the chatelaines after I came home so now I just have each tool is hanging where it belongs with only one chain on it. But the other chains I saved and I got a lovely jewelry organizer box and I took those chains and I added jump rings to them and fixed them so that I can attach them to other tools that I collect later. So I'm teaching myself about cutting chain and organizing chains into shadow lanes. And I'm, it's just a way of playing. It's a new craft and I'm really enjoying it. Meanwhile, I don't know if you remember a while back, I went to Joanne's and I wanted to make flannel skirts. And I, this is a while back. This was back at like episode two of this series, I think. And I found my old flannel skirt pattern, which I believe was a half circle skirt pattern. And I love it. It was a simplicity pattern from the early 90s and it was complete with a waistband and that allowed you to sort of go larger on the waist than you normally would with a typical half circle, full circle, three quarter circle pattern cut. Okay, so I had that in the quarantine. I actually posted it on the Cottage Core Facebook page. It's now defunct because somebody asked for it because I was wearing one of them in a picture. Well, all right, so I wanted to go back and find that and I wanted to make more flannel skirts, which is a goal I've had for a few years now. 
So there I am in Joann's, and the last time I was there, they didn't have dirt for flannel, and I thought, that's so sad. They used to sell these great flannels. Okay, so I go in there Wednesday afternoon. They have flannel everywhere, like three complete aisles of it. Wonderful in all these colors and patterns. So terrific and 40% off. So I ended up buying two skirts worth. Each would be $18. And then I came home and I started cleaning out the study and I can't find the pattern. This led to a wonderful search on everywhere on the web and I found a copy, I think, of the pattern. And so that should be arriving soon. I bought it on Amazon. It is defunct. I bought it from one of their other merchants who had really good ratings and had a copy of it. And I paid like three bucks for it. Really wonderful. So everybody cross your fingers because we're going to see how that works. In the meantime, I started really considering an idea. I've been bouncing around, which is starting my own Etsy store because I have a lot of crafty odds and ends that I would like to sell, including chatelaine bases or sort of jewelry rigged chatelaines that I want to design myself for knitting versus embroidery with tools etc. Stay tuned but I also want to sell off some of my knit pieces that I'm not wearing like some of my hand woven scarves or crocheted scarves or whatnot. We'll see if that goes anywhere. Meanwhile I sat around working on my socks as you can see and I got out of control and I experimented with the new needle holder, as you can see above, and I began working on this episode. So I just had this insanely wonderful afternoon. I mean, Thursday was hard to even see patients again because I just had such a holiday in those 23 hours. This led to me cleaning out a lot of my study slash studio. So suddenly I have a lot more floor space. Suddenly all my craft bags and project bags are sort of pushed against the side of the room closest to my feet here. And I've been working on all sorts of things and trying to finish up old projects like bags of granny squares I was making years ago that I just put to the side I didn't really have a use for and all that. And the Roombas got in here and so we got rid of a lot of the dog and cat hair in the place and I did a lot of spinning of Minerva fluff. So I've had a really exciting week and I did a great job on my crafting table, cleaning up everything. I got books off the floor and onto shelves. The reorganization, I finally got my desk almost completely clear, including a special space at the edge for Minerva to sit on so she can stare out the study door the way she likes to. Okay, meanwhile, ASL, well, it's been wild. She had a huge pileup of assignments this week, but with all this time, got through those too. So that was very, very happy. This coming Wednesday night, which I think is the 26th. Yes, I have to go in for class. She gives us every other class off and we just have a lot of work. So this week we're going in and she's got another set of speakers of family with two hearing kids and two deaf parents. So it should be pretty interesting. I also got to watch the movie Coda last week and it's very interesting. It's very interesting. It is not from a deaf perspective, although I don't know why hearing people think it is. It is very much from a hearing perspective, but it's interesting. If you know deaf culture, you know that it's from a French original and they try to translate it into kind of an American vernacular. Parts of it don't work. However, the interesting thing is if you know deaf culture, they are playing on a lot of situations that commonly happen to deaf kids and reversing it so that you have a hearing kid and a deaf family experiencing the same sorts of isolation. It's an interesting experiment. You know right away why the father character got best supporting actor. You will know right away when you get to a certain scene where the expression on his face is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen on film and that's saying something. So I would recommend CODA, but it's a thought-provoking film. Is it an accurate representation of deafness? No, not too much. Of deafness in America? No, not too much. But it is interesting. It has some real thematic value. It's worth seeing. It is very funny. They do hit some things of deaf culture really, really well, including the family's ultimate solution to the problem 
of the fishing community. Okay, the pup date, Captain and Queenie, well, Captain went to the vet today and got some steroids for her nose because she has discoid lupus on her nose, as Eleanor did. So we are trying to just get it under better control so it's not always kind of bleeding in a yucky way and looking scabby. So she started her steroids because the topical meds didn't work because she ate it right off. But everybody's doing okay. Queenie is now 11 months old. Her birthday is coming up May 10th. So she's 11 and a half months and she's in the house a lot more. She can't resist bringing things to me like balls of yarn. So I'm really trying to kind of encourage her not to grab things in my study. She loves to carry around things that smell like me. And you say, well, all right, then, you know, just give her an old slipper or some socks. If only she would accept that. Nonetheless, we do have our queenie around, but we're trying to get her to settle down in the house. Now, with Eleanor, this was a problem as well. And suddenly she just kind of turned a corner and became calm in the house. So I'm hoping Queenie will do this, but you gotta love Queenie because she's just endless happiness and high spirits and fun. In the meantime, there's a lovely picture of my son with his ribbons. He cleaned up at a track meet last week and we're just proud because my hubs and I, of course, we marathoned together on one memorable occasion, my first, the LA Marathon in I think 2003. Yes, I'm looking at the picture. There we are, slim, young, svelte, <laughs> long time ago. But anyway, we are very proud because the Baron has been out and he has been running. I also put in pictures of the two flannels that I purchased at Joann's to make skirts. One has turtles on it and the other is very astrological. They're both very cool. I need to make these skirts. On the calendar, Deaf Nation is coming up at the Pasadena Convention Center on May 6th. I have a room to spend the night so I can drive home on May 7th. That will allow me to hang out in Pasadena. I will probably take one of my computers, one of my tablets, and just dictate the assignment that I have to hand in and take a lot of pictures. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's just kind of a night away where I'm going to go down Saturday morning, hang out at Deaf Nation, and take a lot of pictures and see a lot of things and try not to look so conspicuously hearing and so embarrassingly ignorant of ASL, but it will be cool. I'm really looking forward to it. And then the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference is in Anaheim on December 12th through 17th. I'm living for that. Okay, so Minerva gets the last word, and that would be hang out with your loved ones. I asked my husband to take a representative picture of me knitting with Minerva in my lap, and he couldn't get a good one. But that's the best we could do. It's a little awkward because it's a three-quarter picture and I look enormous in it. But nonetheless, my vanity notwithstanding, it is very typical. And that's what my studio and my workspace look like. You can see the computer is on, but nothing confidential on it. And there is Minerva in my lap, just looking like her own sweet self. Minerva likes to hang out with me all day. She likes to lie in my lap. She encourages me to brush her. But basically, she is just companionable. As I age, I have to tell you, one of the great joys in my life is just hanging out, just spending time with people, not doing anything too special, just being together and being warm and comfortable. If Minerva is any guide, apparently I'm turning into a house cat. I'm okay with that. I've kind of got the personality to go with Minerva's. But at any rate, every house cat knows you should hang out with your loved ones. You should cuddle with them because they're warm and they're comfortable. You should use them as a lap. You should use them to keep you warm. And don't forget to get on the bed, jump right by their face when they're sound asleep at O dawn 100 and bite their nose so that they get up and feed you. But at any rate, Minerva wants you to know you should be hanging out with your loved ones. I think that's all she wrote for today. So I am just going to say, please remember, we are a community. We are at our best when we take care of each other. But we really are. We are at our safest. That when we protect the whole community, we are protecting ourselves. Protecting yourself and ignoring everybody else is notoriously unsuccessful if you're human. So remember, you know the drill. If you're in too close with people, wear a mask. Certainly wash your hands. Certainly don't crowd in too much with people. 
unless you have to, you know, maintain a little distance if you can. And don't forget to get your shots. Don't forget basically to take care of yourselves. I know apparently on May 11th, the whole COVID emergency is officially over. I saw that somewhere this week. I don't know. A lot of people still out there with masks. I will wear them in certain situations. I think you have to be careful. And yeah, I'm due for my six month booster. But regardless of how you look at all this, remember the important thing is please everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.